Father God, as always, it is such a privilege to be able to speak from your word. And as always, Lord, I ask that the Holy Spirit take over. Lord, take self out of the way and, and let your words come through your Holy Spirit. Lord, let, let these, your people, be blessed and challenged by the hearing of your word. Lord, thank you for everyone that's here today. And I pray you will bless us, guide us, and direct us. And you will be glorified mightily by what we do here today. In Jesus' name I pray. <clears throat> Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, this is a first for me, okay? Not a first sermon, but I've never in my life preached the same message back to back two days in a row. So we're going to try this. It's kind of kind of weird for me to do. I mean, you know, I've done revivals where you did five days worth of messages. They were all different. Uh, we've all, we did Sunday morning, Sunday evening services. The messages were all different. But you're going to have the same message to this morning that was preached last night. And so you guys pray for me because like I say, this is, this is new ground for me. So as Moses says, we, have to, we invite you to grab a copy of God's Word. There are Bibles in the back of the pews. There are Bibles on the table. And I'll be using the same translation as, that you have this morning. We're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. So as you're getting to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, I will share with you this message is a three-part message. It won't take that long. Don't, don't leave. It's a three-part message. And we're going, to, we're going to examine, if we're saved, what we're saved from, what we're saved for, and what we're not saved from. So as we delve into God's Word and we look at these things, uh, I just pray that it will open some avenues of, uh, of thought for you as we share with this. Uh, I shared with the group last night, <clears throat> and... Uh, It was interesting to me, personally, as I, as I began to preach early on, I used the word you a lot. You should do this. You shouldn't do that. That's your responsibility. And I, I realized the longer I preached, the more I was preaching to me as much as I was to anybody else in the, in the congregation. So my use of the word you changed mostly to us or we, because I don't have all this figured out either, guys. We're all in the same boat together. We're all growing and maturing together. So understand, as I share with you, I'm sharing with me. We're all in the same place. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. What we do see is Jesus, who was given a position a little lower than the angels. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory, and it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. Praise the Lord. Jesus is the leader fit to bring us into salvation. So if we need to be saved, evidently we need to be saved from something, correct? Correct. So I want to give you a few things, and this is no, by, by no means a complete and deep look into what everything salvation means, but as I thought about this, I don't want to get too involved because if you were here, if you're a regular attender here, you've, Moses, the last time he preached, took us pretty much into the cellar of human deprivation. And I know the next couple of weeks we're going to start climbing out. And we're going to be lifted up. So I wanted to touch on this, but just briefly, because I don't want to take from what Mo Brother Moses is going to bring us in the, in the coming weeks. So, and, and I shared last night, almost everybody I've ever met, and I can't think of anybody I, that is ex exempt from this, d received Jesus as Savior, accepted Christ for a selfish reason. Almost every one of us. There are some things that we, as humans, if you believe God's word, need to get away from. 
I know when people were witnessing to me, they told me, you can receive eternal life. That sounded pretty good. You don't have to die. Wow, okay, that sounds good. I can be saved from that. And other people uh, described to me the presence of hell. Dark place, place of suffering, a place absolutely separated from God that was reserved for Satan and his demons. Yeah, well, I don't want to go there either. So that's, and, and for almost everybody I've met, talked to and met, when they come to a, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, it's for a reason like that. Maybe, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen, that somebody heard about Jesus and said, wow, that's just fantastic. I'm, I'm just falling in love with him. And that's the only reason I want to know him as my savior. Hopefully, we're all growing in that direction. Hopefully, we're all getting to the point where we grow in love more with Jesus Christ every day. He can't love us anymore, but we can love him more. So the first thing I think I want to share with you is John 1.29, where the, John the Baptist said, when he saw Jesus coming, he was going to baptize him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. First thing we're saved from, guys, are the consequences of our sins. Let me dwell on that just a minute. The eternal consequences of our sins we are saved from. My sin, your sin, was paid for on the cross of Jesus Christ. We are eternally saved from that. Now, if we get into something we're not supposed to here on this earth, there are going to be consequences. If we break the law, there's going to be consequences. So we're not saved from any and all troubles, but we're saved eternally from the consequences of sin. Have you ever heard it said, I don't believe that a good and loving God would send anyone to hell? You ever heard that said? When people say that to me, I agree with them 100%. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You know what? God doesn't send anybody to hell. People work to go to hell. You work for wages, right? You got a job. You do that job all week long. Come to the end of the week, they give you a reward. They give you your wages. Can't work for God. Can't work for God's wages. God's a gift. I said this last night, and I'm going to tell you again today. In good old southern vernacular, if it ain't a gift, it ain't the gospel. That's bottom line, guys. So, people work to end up in a place they don't want to go. That ought to break our hearts. You know that? That ought to really break our hearts. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, which is one of my favorite verses of the Bible, says we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm kind of paraphrasing here. And not of works so no one could boast. Be so thankful for God's saving grace. Saved from sin, saved from death. John eleven twenty six, Jesus said, even though someone dies, yet he shall live. You know what, guys? For, for a believer, for a true believer in Jesus Christ, death is just a step. It's a step from the, ter from the temporal to the eternal. Amen. You know what? That is really absolutely, and I appreciate the amens. I told the group last night, amens are appreciated. If you can't vocalize an amen, this means yes, so I can agree with, we can all agree that way, okay? So, always knows that somebody, always nice to know somebody's paying attention and listening and agreeing, so. All right, as I move along in this, one of the other things we're saved from is slavery. Did you ever consider yourself a slave? Did you ever think about it? Well, God's word says that we're slaves to whatever we choose to obey or whoever we choose to obey. So I can be a slave to Jesus Christ and that's a great place to be. Or I can be a slave 
to the adversary or the idols of the adversary. And that's a bad place to be. And people in the United States of America, we don't think about slavery very much. You know, we're free. We do what we want to do. We do what we want when we want to do it. No, we make choices that put us into bondage somewhere. I think, and I didn't look at this verse right now, but I think it actually says you're either, we're either slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. I don't know about you, but I want to be a slave to righteousness. I want to be where God wants me to go. I don't want to be where Satan wants me to go. Save from that. Save from that. And as I uh, wind down about this, because it's going back, I said this is a very short synopsis. We're saved from hell. I mentioned that earlier. <clears throat> God says in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, and his disciples were praising him, praising Jesus because they were able to come against evil spirits. And God said, don't rejoice because the evil spirits have to listen to you. Rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Wow. God keeps great records. God keeps great records. And he writes our names. He writes our names in his book. And that's not only a New Testament thing, but Moses, Moses in the Old Testament, not Pastor Moses, Moses in the Old Testament said, do not blot my name out from your book. God has been keeping records since eternity began. Wow. And I can't fathom since eternity began. Just like I can't fathom eternity future. Doesn't compute. But I know it exists. I know it's been there. And I know it's fantastic because the Word says that it's fantastic. So if we've been saved from something, we've been saved for something. Make sense? You know, there's a reason. There's a reason we were saved. And believe it or not, it wasn't because you were the cutest, greatest, most personable person that's ever lived on the face of the earth. Thankfully. Thankfully. Amen, Herb. Amen. You've never been called cute, Rich. <laughs> well, God saved us for a reason. Several reasons, actually. And a lot of people will say, well, you're just saved because so you can go to heaven. Yeah, praise God. We are saved. We have a citizenship in heaven. Our names are written in that book. We're going to be with him. But it's much more than that. God deals us with in the here and now. Jesus deals with us, with us in the here and now. Ephesians 2.10 says we were saved unto good works which were ordained beforehand before you or I ever even thought about receiving Jesus Christ as our Savior. Before you or I ever thought about serving Jesus Christ, he had already put in plan and in his works what we were going to do. He knew we were going to do good works. He's prepared them beforehand. They're there. You know what? That's fantastic. That's fa He's in charge. Amen? Amen? We are saved for fellowship. Uh, the, the scriptural reference I'll give you is 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 9. And as I was sharing with someone last night, guys, check us out. Anytime somebody is preaching God's word to you from a pulpit anywhere, check it out. You know why? Because we're fallible. We're human. We can make mistakes. So check out what we're telling you because we need to be held responsible. I need to be held responsible anytime I'm sharing the Word of God. Pastor Moses needs to be held responsible anytime he's sharing the Word of God. And we can make a mistake. But So I wanted to bring that up. That Take a note. Take notes. Take notes. It's amazing what you can learn when you go back if you do like some of us in the middle of the week and you start looking at the scriptures that were given, it's amazing how much more it, it, you can apply it to your daily lives. We're talking about fellowship. 
I'm going to really date myself here, okay? I did some of you here last night know what I'm going to say. Besides Marty and myself, because I know we've been, how many of here have been to an all-day sing and dinner on the grounds? Amen, there you go. And it is so neat. It was so neat. We don't do that much anymore. I don't find churches doing that much anymore. What was that? That's when a group of churches would come together, various choirs, bands, or whatever, and it would begin in the morning, and we'd begin singing, and we'd just sing praises to the Lord, and at some point in that, we'd take a break, and we would have a dinner, probably bordered on gluttony, is what we were doing. <laughs> and after that, we would come back and finish out the day, singing praises to the Lord. You know, I, I feel like we've lost something in the church when we got away from that. Maybe that's too old-fashioned anymore. I don't know. I, we've actually, Marty and I have actually been to all-night sings. I don't know if you've ever attended one of those where the singing started about the time it got dark and lasted all the way to daylight. And I want you to know there's something very special about a group of Christians singing praises to the Lord at 4 o'clock in the morning. It really is. That word fellowship, as I looked at it, it talks about serving in the spirit and serving one another for the common interest and the common good. We as, we as, we as Christians need to get back to fellowshipping more. I firmly believe that. I firmly believe that. Third thing I want to share with you. You were saved to serve. You know, we look at that sometimes and we think, well, you know, the pastor's supposed to serve. The elders are supposed to serve. This one's but we are supposed to serve. Individually, we are supposed to serve. Romans chapter 7, verse 6 says we should be serving in the spirit. Galatians 5, 13 says we should serve one another in love. I'm to serve you in love. You are to serve me in love. We are to serve each other in love, guys. And when we're serving each other, and as I look at serving, I'm thinking, putting somebody else first above all of what we're thinking about, hmm, that's when we're really experiencing the life in Christ that we should experience. Very first Sunday school class that I was in after I got saved, and that's a, another story in and of itself, but uh, just for those of you that don't know me, I was raised in a church family. I knew a whole bunch about, about Jesus Christ. I didn't know Jesus Christ. In my 30s, 30 something years, I met Jesus Christ personally. And I began to have a personal relationship with him. And that's when I really got involved in coming to his house, being with his people, studying his word. The very first Sunday school class I went to had a big sign that said JOY. And it was used as an acronym. Jesus, others, and you. Jesus was a priority. Others came ahead of us. You know what? I love that. I love that. We care so much about each other. We care more about each other than we do ourselves. I hope we're there. I hope we're there. And the last thing I want to share with you is we were saved to go to heaven. We were saved to go to heaven. John 17, 24 talks about being in heaven in the glory of Jesus Christ. I like a little humor every once in a while. As I thought, I thought about this message and about heaven, I thought about it, the story is told about this pastor that's preaching about heaven. And he got to a point in his message and he says, everybody wants to go to heaven, stand up. Everybody stood up, but one old guy down in the front row. And the pastor's kind of amazed. This guy's just sitting here and everybody wants to go to heaven, stand up, and he doesn't stand up. So he walks down, he looks at him, he said, friend, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? And the guy said, oh yeah, when I die, pastor, but I thought you were getting up a load to go right now. <laughs> Isn't that true? We all want to go to heaven. We just don't want to go through whatever we're going to experience to get there. But it's, you know what? 
There's a better place waiting, guys, where our true citizenship is. Amen. Where our true citizenship is. Okay, so there's a brief, brief kind of study on what we've been saved from and what we've been saved for. You can get much, much deeper in that. That's the good news. And the good news is that it's great. It's fantastic. Now comes the bad news. It's not terribly, not terrible bad, but it's uh, things to think about. Things that we have not been saved from. And I will probably go and, and bear with me as I go to various scriptures because uh, after the strokes, my hands don't work too well. It takes me a little while to get there. So first scripture I want to give you and the first thing we are not saved from is temptation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Do you know this? Being tempted, there's no sin in being tempted. Temptations are going to come. The words just said, temptations are coming. The King James puts it this way. No temptation has come upon you such, such as is common to man. It comes to all of us. The things that tempt you may not be the things that tempt me. The things that tempt me may not tempt you. But we've all got some kind of temptation. Something that comes and looks good and we can succumb to it and it becomes a problem in our lives. It's also a matter of choice, guys, because it says right here in the Word, the temptation is going to come, but God will always make a means of escape. You have to look for the escape path. You have to look for what's going to bring you out of that point. You have to look of how you can run from that temptation. But it's going to come. It's one of the things we haven't been saved from is temptation. Second thing, doubt. Anybody in here ever had any doubt? Huh? Absolutely. Really? Yeah, but we're, we're God's people, you know, guys. Come on now. <laughs> yeah, really. Listen to what Jesus said. And this is after he was resurrected. This is said to his disciples after his resurrection. Now, they had walked on the earth with him for three and a half years. They had seen him walk on water. They had seen him feed 5,000 people out of a lunchbox. They had seen him raise the dead and he preached to them all that time. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be resurrected. Three and a half years they've heard this over and over and over. This scripture, Luke 24, verse 38, is Jesus talking to them after he appears after the resurrection. And it says the group sees him and they were frightened. In verse 38 he says, why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? I am pretty sure if the disciples of the Lord who walked with him all that time, step by step, was, were with him daily, could have doubts, we can have doubts. We can have doubts. And, and as I said about temptation, it's not a sin to doubt. It's not a sin to doubt. It's a growing experience. You can learn from it we can grow from it. We can go forward from doubt. I shared with you earlier, the, uh, John the Baptist had said at Jesus' baptism, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This same John, over in the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 3, sends a group of his disciples to see Jesus. And they come and they ask him, hey, are you the one? Are you the, really the Messiah? Or should we look for someone else? You're talking about John the Baptist who baptized Jesus, who declared him as the Messiah, who said, I testify of him as the Messiah. And now he's having doubts. Guys, if doubts came to those people, doubts are going to come to us. We're going to have time that we really have to get 
down and absolutely believe what God said. I want to share an illustration with you. I shared this with the group last night, and it's, it's got some personal connotations. But the cure for doubt is belief. Ponder that for a minute. The cure for doubt is belief. Years ago, when our son was very small, he's about three years old, we lived in the forest. I mean, we lived in the forest, okay? We had two neighbors. One was a half a mile in one direction. One was a quarter mile in the other direction. And we'd probably still have been there, but civilization closed in on us. And I had all kinds of physical problems, and so we ended up not living in the forest anymore. Well, we lived in the forest. Marty and I are both working. He's in daycare. And we had a house that was up on pilings, and so it's up off the ground. And he had a little kitten, little kitten. You can put it in the palm of your hand. Just a little, kid, little bitty kitten. And we had the place fixed up on the porch. We had a big covered porch. Had the place fixed up on the porch for the kitten. And we'd leave the kitten in the morning, come back in the evening, and he'd play with the kitten. Well, one, one evening we come home, no kitten. And I wasn't even sure it could get down the steps by itself. And I knew where we lived that there were animals that it wouldn't even have made a good snack, let alone a meal. So I'm beginning to tell our son, son, you know, you may, Kitty may not be back. And I'm trying to talk to him. Well, that night when he were putting him to bed, he looks at me and he says, Daddy. And I said, yeah. And he says, Kitty be back. I've already prayed to God. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I, I know anything can happen, son. But, and I know that he got that because I remember the Sunday school teacher he had. And, and those little three and four year olds, she would gather them up and she'd take prayer requests from those little guys. And she was teaching them to pray. And I went, well, son, yeah, God can take care of Kitty. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. So we go to work the next day and we come home. No kidding. Yeah. And I'm trying to decide how I can tell my son that things happen. Because, you know, God may need some help. So I'm trying to make sure he doesn't get turned off to Jesus because the kitten's gone. We get up, go to work third day. No kitten as we leave. So I decided when I got to work that day, I'd do my very best Abraham impression. I'm going to find a kitten. Shouldn't be too hard, right? I mean, it's got to be pretty much the right color and it's got to have pretty much the right markings. But, you know, people give away kittens all day, every day. Shouldn't be too hard to find a kitten, right? I searched all day long for a kitten. I could not. Would you believe I couldn't find a kitten? Imagine that. That evening, we come rolled up in the driveway. You guessed it. Guess what happened? Here come the kitty around the side of the house. It didn't even look worse for wear. It's been out there for three days, and it looked like everything was great. And I'm thinking, wow, Lord. Childlike faith. Childlike faith. When we recognize that God's in charge. And he can take care of whatever situation, even so much as to a little old kitten. So a young kid could see how the glory of the Lord works. I've, that has stuck with me all of these years that we, I asked Marty on the way home last night, I said, do you remember the kitten? She said, yeah, I remember what happened with the kitten. Childlike faith, guys, that dispels doubt. That's where we need to go. Okay, moving right along. The next thing we're not saved from, and everybody ought to like this one, discipline. Yeah. That'll give us food for thought, won't it? The King James uses chastisement. Most of the uh, other uh, versions use discipline. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 beginning in verse 5. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, 
Remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are a illegitimate and are, re and are not really his children. Hmm. I shared with this in one church we were in and a lady just absolutely flipped out with it. She just, I don't like that. I like to think of God as a merciful, gracious, heavenly father who just takes care and gathers me in and does great things for me. And as I talked to her, I found out she had a father who was abusive with discipline, a biological father. And every time we talked about discipline and God the Father, she was thinking about her biological father. Let me tell you, God is not an abusive father. And you know when discipline quits? As soon as we learn the lesson. God doesn't say, you know, I disciplined you and you did it, you, you, you've straightened out, you, we've, you've moved past whatever was giving us a hard time, but maybe I ought to give you just a little bit more taste of discipline so you won't do it again. No, that's not God. God takes us as far as he needs to in the discipline area until we have learned, until we have matured through whatever we need to do that's going to bring us closer to him so we can be his child. Amen. You know, when you read that, that, if he doesn't discipline you, you are illegitimate and not really his children. Sometimes we ought to get up and go, thank you, Jesus, I'm being disciplined. You know why? Because that says I'm your child. I know I'm your child because you had to get on me and you love me enough to discipline me. I hope that if you have children, grandchildren, that you do discipline them lovingly, uh, tempered with grace, because that's the way God disciplines us. But actually... The word in, back over in Psalms, I believe it is, or Proverbs rather, says that if you do not discipline your children, you hate your children. So God, the good father, is going to discipline us because he loves us. Another thing we're not saved from. Moving right along. You all uplifted yet? <laughs> not a very uplifting time, but it's a great time. Things we need to know. Things I think we need to hear. Amen. Thank you. We are not saved from persecution. Hmm. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Doesn't say might. Doesn't say may. Doesn't say it could happen. Says we will suffer persecution. We did a study in this church uh, uh, about the uh, voice of the martyrs. People in some of the uh, Middle Eastern countries and some of the South American countries and some of the countries where if we were in a, in a service like this this morning, if we were here sitting and we were preaching and we were sharing Jesus Christ, we would stand in danger of armed guards coming through the back door and they kill everybody in the room. Praise God, in this country, we don't face that kind of persecution. But, as Christians, we can face persecution almost daily simply because people don't believe and they look at what we preach and what we teach and what we try to live and they say, well, that's foolish. Why would you do that? Or I don't believe that. Well, you know, that's their prerogative. And when they tell us that, we just need to understand Jesus said uh, in John 15, 20, since they persecuted me, naturally will they persecute you. Amen. Jesus said it, guys, it's going to happen. Understand that when Jesus makes a statement, it's going to happen. Part of it. Also, Jesus, when talked about persecution, said that those that, re those that suffer persecution are building eternal rewards. So when we're being persecuted, 
we're, we're building rewards. We're building kingdom rewards. We are building what God wants us to be. We're learning. We're maturing. And it's not much fun. Agree with you. Not much fun when you're persecuted. But it's going to happen. All right, I'm getting closer. Next thing. Sorrow. As a Christian, you know, when I was first saved, nobody really shared these kind of things with me. Nobody really brought these kind of things out that I would, uh, so I would know about what I might see what was coming. And it, it's almost like when you first get saved and people are trying to, and I think they're trying to, because they care for us and they begin to share with us, well, you know, if you get saved, you go to heaven and Jesus is with you and you can pray and he answers your prayers. And man, every, you know, guys, it's not always perfect. It's like, I always think about, uh, you know, the fairy tales where uh, the, the fair damsel meets Prince Charming and they get married and they live happily ever after. Anybody married? <laughs> Let me tell you what. It's not exactly the way it works, guys. I can promise you that. Now, Marty and I have been together for oh, 47 years or so, 44 of those years, I think, in, in marriage. And, uh, well... <laughs> Let's put it this way. There's been a rocky time or two, okay? <laughs> Pretty much now it's, it's smoothed out and we, we don't have much, many, many problems at all. But there were a few rocky spots going through there. You know, the happily ever after, no. Somebody needs to be truthful with people and let them know, hey, you know what? There's going to be some rough spots you need to work through. Listen to what Paul told the church at Corinth. And Paul loved the church at Corinth. He, he birthed that church. But they had some problems. They had uh, gone astray in some ways. And you can go back and study that, but I'm going to uh, give you a scripture from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 9. And I'll back up just a minute. Paul's talking about a letter that he sent to that church, severely criticizing them and, and admonishing them for not stepping up and doing what they should have done in the very beginning. Now he writes this letter to them and he talks about it being painful to them. In verse 9, I'm picking up. Now I am glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. Let that sink in for a minute. It's the kind of sorrow that God wants his people to have. <coughs> so you were not harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow which lacks repentance results in spiritual death. Did you ever stop and think that, here's a passage that says, God wants you to experience this type of sorrow? Anybody ever tell you when you first got saved? Now, now there's some sorrow God wants you to experience along the way. I don't imagine. Nobody ever told me that. I had one guy. Did you really? Yes, I did. Praise God. Praise God. But, you know, and that sorrow is for our benefit. That sorrow, it says, leads us into repentance. And basically, if you, it's implied we're... we're delivered from spiritual death because of that sorrow. It's the sorrow is over sin. The sorrow is over sin in our life. That's the kind of sorrow God wants us to have. And you know sin ought to really anger us. Because if we don't get anger, angry over sin for no other reason, we should be angry about sin because of what it cost God. Amen. I tell everybody all the time, Salvation is definitely free, but it wasn't cheap, and it isn't cheap. It costs God tremendously. Wow. And we should be sorrowful about sin. We can rejoice because that sin is forgiven, and that sin has is, is, uh, been bought and paid for on the cross. But you know what? 
sorrowful, sorrowfulness for sin will bring us where we need to be. And Christian, bad news. You're going to sin sometimes. Yeah. Sorry to tell you, but it's true, Rich. You're going to sin sometimes. But that sorrow that leads us to repentance and then brings us into a more mature relationship and a better relationship with God. All right. One more. One more. We are not saved as Christians from judgment. What did he say? He said, we're not saved as Christians from judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. And just as each person is destined to die once, after that comes the judgment. Every human being is going to go through some type of judgment. Now the good news is if you're saved, that great white throne of judgment that's discussed in Revelation chapter 20, I've never come to a clear understanding as whether we as a church will be present at that or not. But if we are, we'll be present as observers, we won't be present under indictment. So there is a great white throne of judgment where God the Father will separate the saved from the unsaved. Granted. There is also a judgment seat which we who are saved will stand before. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, and I'm going to begin in, well, I'm going to begin in verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. Excuse me. Speaking here to servants of Christ. For no one can lay any foundation other than one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation, Jesus Christ, may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewel, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Guys, we're going to stand before Jesus Christ at some time, and we're going to give an account of what we've done, and he is going to say, you really did good with what I gave you. You built on a gold, silver, jewels, and all the precious stuff. Or you know what? You could have done a lot better. Your building was temporal. The good news is we may lose some rewards, but eternity is assured. Because as I've already said, eternity was assured through the cross of Christ, not by anything we have done. Amen. Amen. Your name is written in that book of life, in God's book of life. I shared with the group last night, and I'm definitely not a scholar, but I've always heard it described as the seat where Jesus would, uh, would interrogate us as the Bema seat of judgment. I don't know if you've ever heard that or not. And I said last night, can you show me in the Word where it says that? And so I did what anybody in this day and age does when they don't understand something. I Googled it. And this is the, what Google, gave the, the, the definition Google gave me about a Bema seat of judgment. It was a seat of the, at the ancient Olympics where the judge sat to determine the finishing position of the competitors. He was first, he was second, he was third on down the line. Somewhere that had got applied theologically. I don't really know where. I really don't know how. But suffice it to say, I'm not too concerned what God, what Jesus calls that time that he'll interrogate us, what he calls a position, but, but I'm, I am willing to understand, and yes, that we're going to come there. I want to close sharing with you what to me is the scariest verse in scripture 
verses in scripture that I have a hard time with. Matthew chapter 12. We're going to begin in verse 35. Jesus speaking here. It's written in red. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Now, I don't know about you, but I think over my life, I've, I've, I'm certain I've uttered more than my share of idle words. You know, and I told the group last night, I'm not even sure what comprises an idle word, but I do know this much. I know this, this would be considered, I believe, an idle word. We are given the opportunity to witness to someone. The door is open. They are, they're there. They are ready to hear about Jesus Christ. We have been put in that place to share with them the truth of Jesus Christ. We have found personal favor with them. We're sitting there and we begin to talk and out of our, word, out of our mouths comes something like this. Boy, isn't the weather nice today? It's idle words, guys. It's idle words. And I believe there's some of, all of us, I don't believe it's all of, I believe all of us have uttered some idle words from time to time. And that's scary to me that we'll give an account for it. And I don't know how your, well, your account's going to be, but I believe my account's going to be all I can do, Jesus, is throw myself on your mercy and your grace and say, Lord, I messed up. But thank God you love me enough to pay for the times I messed up. So think about that anytime we get a chance to speak to people. Uh, I did look up that word idle and it, it translates to, by implication, useless. And that's where I come up with that illustration. Because if, if I'm given the opportunity to share Jesus Christ with somebody and I don't do it. Whatever, whatever I say at that time is useless. It's idle. It's not worth having. So guys, that was the, the bad news. And like I said, the bad news isn't all that bad. There's ways out of it. We are delivered from a lot of it. But it's going to come. We're going to have some issues. My prayer is, is, as those issues come, we use them to grow and mature. We use them to bring us further along. Now, I have never in my life shared the Word of God that I didn't allow a time of response. I firmly believe God's Word does not return to Him void. So, I'm going to pray as closed here in a moment. We're going to share a song and the lights will be lowered. If you need to pray about something, and this is not the temple, okay? If you need to pray about something, you can do it at your seat. I'll be up here to greet you if you want to pray about something. If there's something you need to discuss, we'll do that. God's Word said something and you just need to talk about it, we'll be here. Because I believe God wants people to respond to His Word. So we're going to have a word of prayer. We'll have a song. I'll be at the front during the song if you need to speak about anything. And after that, we will be dismissed. You guys have a really, really great day. We'll be back here at 4 o'clock this afternoon for Bible study. I love you. I thank you for being here. I thank you for endure, enduring my speaking. I thank you for God sharing a message with us this morning. Pray with me, please. Father God, I always wonder at the end of a message if I've done justice to your holy word. But Lord, it's not about me, it's about you. And so I pray, Lord, that your word has gone forth. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit has moved in lives. And, and I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will use the feeble attempts of this preacher to bless, encourage, and challenge these, your people. I pray, Lord, as we go from here, you'll give us traveling mercies. You'll be with us the rest of the day, the rest of all of our days. I pray you'll guide and direct us. I pray, Lord, you'll bring us to someone that needs to know Christ as Savior. And then, Father, our words are not idle, but our words are useful. 
that we might show them the truth of the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person that's here today. Thank you, Lord, for this place of worship. Lord, I do lift up Pastor Moses and his family. Lord, give them the rest and the relaxation that they need to come back uh, invigorated and ready to help us continue to grow and learn and be about your business. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for being in our presence today. It's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen.